and welcome to another Scots Way podcast. And this time around, I'm with Peter Mackie Burns. Hello, Peter. Hello there. Um, Peter is the director of Daphne, um, critically acclaimed, I think it's fair to say. New feature film, which um, comes out uh, September the 29th. September the 29th. So, obviously, to start with, tell us a bit about Daphne. Sure, uh, Daphne is a narrative film, a fiction feature, a character based about a woman who's 31, although she pretends to be 29, <laughs> who's dissatisfied with a lot, and she is a bit too cool for school, right. and she works in a, a restaurant in the kitchen. Right. <laughs> no direct experience. No direct experience coming from there, absolutely. Uh, and she is a university dropout, an ex uh, philosophy and English lit dropout. Okay. And she's, I have to use a swear word here, she's she's an existentialist. Oh, nay! Nee. <laughs> You're amongst friends here, you know you. Yeah, uh, <laughs> she, she gets. She's a bit. F- she doesn't really mix very well. She's not a joiner in her, right. as my mother would say. Hell is other people. Hell is other people, absolutely. And one night she walks into a shop for a pack of fags and without giving too much away, she saves the shopkeeper's life because she, she gets involved in a fracas with a, uh, an angry guy with a, a knife and she saves the shopkeeper's life and it makes her reevaluate her own right. uh, existence in a sense. Okay. Um, now, it's cast with... Emily Beecham. Oh, yes. And she was in the short film that you did previously, Happy Birthday to Me, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Um, is that where the character kind of came from? Sure, yeah. That was a 10-minute short film uh, that I made that became a prototype, as it were, for the feature film. So yeah. it was the same actor and the same character, and we thought, well, what would happen to this character two years down the line? So the way the way I work uh, on, on stories is basically I, I write a really detailed biography, like a really, really, really poor first person novel. Okay. It's a couple of hundred pages uh, of the central character's life. Okay. And what I do is I put everything in. So I give the actor the reading list, everything they read at uni, their first year English lit reading list, Billy like Lloyd Cole. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I sent her to work in a kitchen for a while. Oh, did you? Yeah. Okay. So we did all that stuff. So a bit like Mike Lee without the lunch. <laughs> <laughs> right. So we did that for quite a while, you know. And so t- together, years. I mean, was it this just you saying that yeah. to Emily? This yeah, is what so I, I, I'd write the, the stuff mm-hmm. and I'd give pages now and again to Emily because the way she works is she's very um, instinctive. And she doesn't want to know everything, but she'd like to try some exercises to get to know the character. So we did this for a couple of years. So when we were on the a set, of years, wow. yeah, from the time with the character in the short film to the feature film, mm-hmm. it was basically two years to the day. And we thought, well, what happened to this character in two years' time, you know? And so when we get to the set to shoot, we don't rehearse anything. Okay. So she knows the character. Yeah. And we don't do many takes either. So we don't rehearse and we don't do many takes. So I try to get all of the actors. And I work like that with all of the, the cast. Okay. Because this is obviously um, oh, it's a, cast. It's a larger cast than, than you've done pre- sure, previously. Sure, yeah. yeah. So how difficult is that if you're involving the kind of other major uh, actors? It, it just depends really. So, uh, you know... It, it depends on how the actors you choose, how they work, how they like to work. I wouldn't say there's a prescriptive way of working with everything, every actor. Mm-hmm. Some actors, they're so busy that if you at least meet them in advance, chat a lot about the character with them, that's their, their work, you know? Some you need to do every day with, some you meet a few times before they turn up on the set. Um, but that method of working, in a sense... Um, I think I stole that from from Woody Allen. He right. doesn't rehearse. Yeah. yeah. And he doesn't do lots of takes either. So it keeps the the cast sort of they bring their game, 
Yeah, you know? yeah. So they're, they're they're ready to go by the time we get to the set. We don't sit around discussing anything to do with the character. So there's not uh, this idea that people are over rehearsed or are just simply saying lines that no rehearsing at all. Yeah. So they have their pages, you know, and they come in and we shoot as quickly as we can. And I try to cast people that I think are pretty good. And an old I can't remember which director told me. I think it was. Terence uh, Davies told me he taught me for a, a little while. He said, um, "Cast the best people you can and mm. get out of the way. Yeah, let them work. You know. Yeah, you don't need me giving <laughs> giving them tips <laughs> on acting. But because I made the character, mm -hmm. then we can chat about that and the the channel. So, and, and do the characters know each other's characters, or do they just know their own and then come? And it, I give them all a script." Yeah. so there is a script and I work with a writer and we work in quite an unusual way where I do most of the character work and Nico Mansinga, a very talented screenwriter I work with from the shot to he listens and he writes drafts very quickly and then we look at what we have and we cull lots of characters so oh, right, that's each draft we do you know there could be like 25 characters and the next time we do the draft we've lost 10 of them and sometimes the number goes up, but often it comes down. So in that process, um, I mean, you've created the character in the sense that you've got the backstory for them and, sure. and all of that stuff, and then the writer, is it that where the dialogue comes in? Yeah, the dialogue and the structure too. Yeah. You know, so we, we meet, we chat, we work really closely with the producers, uh, Valentina Brazzini and Tristan Golliger at the Bureau, and what we do is we all talk about the characters and we talk about the structure and we structure the work and you know in detail and then Nicol writes very quickly and he brings it back and we, we work in it but while that process ha is happening mm -hmm. the core character so Emily plays Daphne's in every scene in the film yeah right so she's the one that yeah. basically we'd spend most of the time with and I'd phone her and say could you go and look at this uh, exhibition because the character might go and have a look, look at that or could you go and see this gig she might wander along to there so I suppose I'm quite interested in a, a sociological approach mm -hmm. you know yeah. so one, one of the questions we asked ourselves we set the film in Elephant and Castle which is a an area in South East London it's in Zone 1 mm -hmm. it's very close to the, the West End but it's a traditionally very working class area but it's gone through massive redevelopment I believe Jim Davidson set a sitcom there and up the elephant around the castle yes. <laughs> it has a more famous uh, resident or had a more famous resident Charlie Chaplin oh right okay it's on that now. it's well the new Kent Road is yeah that becomes the old Kent Road so that area has been massively gentrified in the past two or three years and we thought I know the area really well so as recent as that yeah and still has been now it's so if this is where Daphne is from and you're saying that her character is developed over two years, then those changes are part of her... That's part of the story. So right. basically what we said was this character's going on... The area's going under massive gentrification, you know? Mm -hmm. People are being thrown out. People are moving in. And we thought, well, this would be a great place to put this character because it's a bit like her. Yeah. And I know the area really well. So because I, I studied Goldsmiths, when I go to London, I stay in Elephant and Castle. In fact, if you see the film, mm -hmm. the film shot where I stay. You're right. It shot my friend's flat. She lives upstairs and they rent a flat out downstairs. Mm -hmm. So I rented the flat and we shot. We made that Daphne's apartment. Okay. So I was living where we were shooting. And all of the locations, with, with the exception of maybe three or four in the whole film were all within walking distance. So I'm interested, I suppose, in a sense of place. So there's a cinematic language, you know, or shorthand for London, and we thought it'd be interesting not to, to explore yeah. that. So not to have the wheel and yeah, the Yeah, absolutely. The, to show a, a, a bit of London that you don't normally see. Yeah. And, and, and we thought, well, why a film about a 31-year-old woman mm. being a middle-aged Glaswegian male you know and with the producers myself we sat down and we thought women we know we are not seeing them in the cinema in the context of of 
London, mm -hmm. for example, but people we know everywhere yeah. in Glasgow, everywhere, you know, people live in cities. And we ask ourselves a question, how does a normal person live in a city now that's yeah. single? Mm -hmm. And particularly London. Yeah, particularly London, a victim of its own financial success, yeah. where people can't afford to live anymore. Uh, the rents are going up, but the wages aren't. Mm -hmm. What do you do? Yeah, you working know? in catering. Yeah, Absolutely. exactly. It's the last refuge of the, the middle class kid now, yeah. especially if they're an arts graduate, because they can still do something creative and pay the rent, mm -hmm. you know, because it's extraordinary now. So around that area in South East London, there's a very foodie area okay. full of middle class kids who are arts graduates and they call them the friendly mafia <laughs> <laughs> and the food's fantastic and yeah people, you know okay. that'd be uh -huh. really interesting to well you know this whole culture the character is very definitely not a, a hipster or a millennial you know mm -hmm. she, she's too good for school but she'll be a bit too old yeah so the question we asked is how does a normal person live and the character she uses Humour is a sort of defence mechanism, you know, sort of gets a retaliation in first. We thought it was probably quite a class region retreat. <laughs> <laughs> but we thought, what do you do when you become the thing you've pretended to be? Yeah. And those are the two questions that basically made us explore this character, you know. So why would a middle-aged man make a film about a 30-year-old woman? I've become a grumpy middle-aged man. <laughs> I've become the thing <laughs> I've been pretending you, to be for all those years. For years. So, in terms of Daphne, she is now becoming the thing that yeah, she's she's, she's too cool to for school. Yeah. But the thing is, she's slightly too old to be too cool for school. You know, so her years of hedonism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She knows she should jack them in. Yeah, you, when you start being the older person yeah. and the party and all yeah. that kind of stuff. And when she managed, she wanders into this sort of robbery in progress in a shop that goes tits up, then it makes her start to think the way she is living isn't, isn't the way she probably should be living. And that's basically the story of the film. Sorry, that was a very long-winded <laughs> answer. But how did then, did the character change from the short film? What, 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 was, what was Daphne like in the short in, film in her late 20s uh, well she still pretends to be in her late yeah. 20s but in her late 20s she was probably drinking more mm -hmm. because she could uh, afford to drink a wee bit more than she does now uh, and in the short film Happy Birthday to Me which you can probably see on Vimeo actually right, it's okay. up there um, put a link to it when we yeah this. I'll, I'll certainly I'll, I'll get one to you uh, she's a bit she abuses alcohol a wee bit more. She's mm -hmm. a wee bit more full on, you know? Whereas at this point in her life, just over the age of 30, she's, well, she's traded something. She's, the, her mother's got her a, a flat mm -hmm. and to live in, to rent, and she's got her a cheap flat. And what she's managed to do, Daphne, she's managed to say, either I have to share with other people and have some disposable income, or I can throw everything in and live in my own. Yeah. And she's chosen the latter. Yeah. So she has no disposable income now. Yeah. But the key thing is she wants this. To be on her own. Yeah, yeah. living on her own. Um, uh, which in London's almost impossible, even in Yeah, I, I, exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting. So we think, well, really, hell really is other people mm -hmm. for her. Because we said, what's the thing she'd fear the most? Group therapy. Yeah. <laughs> other people's needs uh, absolutely um, just to go further into this process of building the character so you give the backstory what she reads does it go to like music and, 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 oh, everything. and what she wears I mean, everything, is that your decision everything so we filter when you see the film uh, you notice her flat so we we work with a fantastic uh, you didn't designer. decorate did you of course <laughs> of course no wonder your friends let you. <laughs> as long as it's tasteful. It does. Well, we painted it back to oh, right, being a white okay. box, of course. Uh -huh. But you did, you redecorated All oh, everything, yeah. The production design was fantastic. Uh -huh. So what we wanted to do is we made a, a film in a working class area, but we didn't want to make a film that looked like a social realist film. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the film closely, it's quite colourful. Right. And what we decided to do was try to use colour in a sort of a, a bit more of an expressionistic mm -hmm. manner. But we tried not to make it feel 
too artificial. Yeah. So I suppose I'm quite interested in two things. I'm interested in realism in terms of performance and acting. Okay. I'm interested in the more expressionistic idea of uh, using colour in the cinematic sense. But yeah. like, I really love Wong Kar Wai. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. He uses colour. I'm a massive. I was going to ask that. Is that the kind of uh, influence that you're huge kind of influence with? in the colour? So the, we use saturated colour. Yeah. So Emily has fantastic uh, red hair, mm-hmm. and we thought, well, how could we make her stand out everywhere? If you look at cities now, they're really colourful though. Yeah. Compared, it's, it's advertising, basically. Yeah. So, every world city looks a bit homogenous because of advertising now. So we thought if we use a very specific area that we know really well in mm-hmm. London, then it's all cliche, but we thought we could try to be universal by showing a part of a city that people know cinematically, if nothing yeah. else, but see it in a different way, you know? And we use, we try to use colour in an expressionistic sense. So if you go to see it, you might see sort of Wes Anderson style colour yes but with our, our realist probably you know a naturalistic acting mm-hmm. in a sense so okay. we, we're big fans of uh, uh, Cassavetes yes huge fans of Cassavetes and A Woman Under the Influence was a massive influence on us as was uh, a few other films I can't about now we saw these films, you know these uh, films you see in America, you know, the Indies, American Indies are great, like a Brooklyn film, like, uh, how, like uh, Francis Ha, maybe? Yeah, yeah, Or, yeah. or uh, what's that? Obvious Child. Have you seen Obvious Brooklyn Child? I've seen Obvious Child. That's a great film. Um, appropriate Behaviour, mm-hmm. have you yeah, seen of that? Yes. That's very much a Brooklyn film. In fact, our designer, Mirren Maranon, was the designer of appropriate behaviour so she's so just like they took an area of New York yeah and gave and it made its it own up. identity yes that we thought why can't we do that here rather than having the London represented as as Big Ben and mm-hmm. Notting Hill do sure. you know yeah. so so London's either kitchen sink estates or it's the West End and we thought well let's see if we can find somewhere that's a bit more interesting so I think visually it, it, it's quite a uh, a, a colourful experience so we tried to, to make the colour clash in a sense with some of you'd think the the, the perceptions of, of a working class area would be mm-hmm. so you think oh if it's a, a sink estate or near a sink estate that's been redeveloped it's going to be grey and yeah. muddy and dark and all you know but actually when you see it I think the cinematographer who's amazing and uh, the designer worked brilliantly. So everything, like in the apartment, we set the, the flat, the actual flat where Daphne lives is next to East Street Market. So we got all of the props as the character would and all of the furniture and the dressings from the market. Mm-hmm. Everything she wears, all the records she listens to that are on the soundtrack right, are all things that she would buy from the, the real market outside where she lives, which is why she can afford to live on her own. So it's got a slightly early 70s um, feeling about the soundtrack. So could you, a couple of tracks from the soundtrack? We, we have a, a Spotify list. Oh, excellent. Which I, I, I think is pretty good, so I'll, I'll, I'll pass it on. And we used an original score. Mm-hmm. And the brilliant young composer, it was his first film, but I can't remember his blooming name. Oh, well, we will add that in. You can add it in. in. But... Um, he played uh, piano when he was really young, in fact, for all of Amy Winehouse's career. Right, that's So he was his first score. He played with Amy Winehouse? Yeah, he was oh, a piano right. player. Wow. So I think in every album he, he did that. And he got a couple of guys in from Amy, Amy Winehouse's band, so three of them he worked on Fantastic. one of the main uh, bits of the score. So we wanted a score that sounded like a song. And it sounded a little bit like Carole King. Okay. So are there, is it all original score or are there tracks? It's a, mix, it's a mixture. It's a mixture. So mixture. there's a very, uh, there's five or six original pieces uh-huh. which link the film and we have different tracks too. Um, we've got a lot of obscure soul from the 70s. Excellent. Yeah, and I'll give you the list. The list yeah. is pretty good. It's a nice, it's a great little mixture. And sometimes when we, we went to Rotterdam and they played the... 
the, the music mm -hmm. in some of the public spaces before the audience went in to see the film. And it seems to get people in a, in a kind of good mood. I'll see if we can do that uh, maybe at some of the, the venues here when we're doing our Q&A tour. Um, which you should mention while we're about the subject. Talk, we're doing a Q&A tour. We are. When. Yeah, I'm kicking off the Q&A tour. Um, it starts this Thursday the 21st in Bristol at the Encounters Film Festival, but we'll be in Glasgow, my hometown, on Saturday night. That's the Saturday coming, which is the 23rd. I think it is, yeah. 8pm 8, 8 GFT. Tickets are available. <laughs> so please pop along where I'll be there with the producer, Valentina, and we'll do a Q&A after the screening. So if anyone's around and they want to come and say hello, please do. I, I really recommend... Um, Checking out the actress who plays Lady Emily Beecham, and mm -hmm. she's pretty special. And yeah, she's got a great CV, and she's on the people band. may have seen her in Hail Caesar. They may have seen her in Hail Caesar. Would that it were? Would that it were? She's in that great scene with Ray Fiennes. Yeah. She looks like Veronica Lake, and because that scene's in black and white, you don't really notice she's got sort of this fiery red hair. But if you're uh, if you're at all interested in Emily Beecham, she's in this great and bonkers show that's uh, out just now called Into the Badlands. All right. Have you heard about this? I know, I don't think I have. Where's it on? This is an AMC show, you know, right. the company that made Mad Men. Yes. Well, they make this show, I think, on the second or third series, so it's a sort of steampunk kung fu show. Oh. <laughs> and Emily plays the a character called The Widow, a sort of leather-clad dominatrix, <laughs> who's the, 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 the nemesis, the baddie in the right, show. Right, okay. And... It's extraordinary, I have to say. So she, she goes from small independent British films to this huge American TV show, which is a bit like a juggernaut, you know. Mm -hmm. Has lots of martial arts fans. She does her stunts and this extraordinary sword play and everything. Um, so having to turn up the Comic Con and things like that. She does, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. She, she does all that. They, 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 they shot the first season in New Orleans and they did the last one in Dublin and I think they're doing a new one in Dublin just now so I think it's I mean it's got a huge following mm. fantastic it's extraordinary so if you're into that stuff I think they made it after they made The Walking Dead yes yeah yeah um, and general in terms of general release for Daphne sure yeah we, we, we have a general release in the UK on the 29th of September that's Friday the 29th of September um, I think we're in quite a lot of uh, UK cities including Excellent. Glasgow and Edinburgh so Glasgow will be at the GFT Edinburgh Film House um, Newcastle Nottingham Bristol yeah, if you search out your London, local yeah. art cinema then there's every chance it'll be. It, it would be there in fact can I give you a wee plug for, there's a website so yep, if you want absolutely. to find out where it's on and book tickets and look at reviews and all sorts it's it Daphne.film Right, and I'll put a link to that on the oh, site as well. Fantastic. Um, and talking of reviews, it's had pretty good reviews, I have to say. We've been really lucky, yeah. We've been really fortunate. Yeah, some people... I mean, if you like character-based films and you like your humour to be quite dark, then, you know, I think this will be for you. Yeah. You know? And what we do like about the characters, we try to make someone that feels three-dimensional yeah like someone you'd you'd sit down next to in the bus you know someone who's cheeky and funny and you know, probably a bit a bit difficult at times yeah. a wee bit chippy at times but you know everyone's got a friend like this and we thought wouldn't it be funny if that was you yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. you're the person. i've not got a friend like that but, uh, yeah you know it's you <laughs> I'm interested because the film is so much about Daphne as you say Emily's in every scene how difficult then was it casting I mean you say you know go for the best people available but was it difficult casting the rest of no we were really really lucky um, we, we worked with a great actress who plays her mother who, who's, whose name is Geraldine James I say, absolutely. very famous absolutely. and wonderful Geraldine absolutely. James and they look like mother and daughter. If you see them very right. close to each other, there's a scene when they're walking down the road and you think, oh my God, they could be related, you know? And 
we met Geraldine and she was extraordinary. She was up for it and, you know, she's done so many wonderful bits of theatre. Yeah, Peter I, Hall said she was the best classical actress oh, really? I've ever worked with. Yeah, I always think of her in the kind of Maggie Smith, Judy Dench, that kind of uh, company. Yeah, she is. She's way up there, and but she's really down to earth, and she she loves new work, you know. And she's oh, she's absolutely extraordinary. She turns up and you know Google her, and you'll see the oh, I think the Gandhi and a lot of Merchant Ivory. Oh, and yeah. all sorts of other things. Oh, yeah. and loads of TV, and oh, she's extraordinary. If you don't know the name. As Peter says, Google her and you'll immediately you'll feel, oh yeah, I've seen her in that. I know, Geraldine Jameson, absolute star. Yeah, a few of the, we had a couple of Scottish actors in there. Mm-hmm. We mixed it up, so we have Irish, Scottish, you know, you name it. Like, uh, to represent London, to represent yeah. South East London. So we got fantastic actors. We were so lucky. We were really, really fortunate with the quality of the cast. A few of them work with Mike Lee quite a bit so they're used to Stuart Macquarie a Scottish yeah, actor yeah I saw he, he was in it yeah, yeah. He was in it. and a, a good Scottish actor called Matthew Pigeon oh Matthew <laughs> Matthew Pigeon <laughs> pops up and does a scene what was great because uh, Daphne's in every scene she meets lots of uh, people so we didn't need anyone for too long you right. know, so we could get good people and we wouldn't have to tie them up on our low wages <laughs> for, for six weeks or, or something like that, you know. So the, the cast is extraordinary, they're really good. Um, moving away, can we talk a little bit about now? You because when I first met you, you were doing theatre, well, like before that, you were still at drama school, but I was um, washing dishes, <laughs> watching in kitchens, and badly. <laughs> um, so you moved from First of all, did you always want to do film even when you were working in theatre and things like that? Was that some... Yeah, I did. I was really... I, tra- I started off doing lots of things and if you're interested in photography or, you know, or writing or drama, you you know, film's a wide umbrella. And I tried quite a few things when I was younger. I studied photography at Building mm-hmm. and Printing in Glasgow. I studied drama at the RSAMD, as it was called then. And I thought the way to get into feature film was to work in theatre and then work in television and then mm. move to but film. That was the path. That was the path that I didn't take. <laughs> <laughs> or, or it didn't choose me. Yeah. So I, I, I worked in theatre for about six or seven years and I enjoyed it. But I always loved film and I always wanted to make films. And I didn't start till I was about 32 or something. Mm. I thought I need to give this a go. So I... I was teaching a bit, I stopped teaching, I went to Goldsmiths to do an MA. Yeah. And while I was there, I decided, right, I'm a certain age now, I'm paying for this myself, I need to give it a go. If I'm going to, you know, if I'm going to do this, I might as well give it a go. And that led to the early short films that you did, which yeah. must have been quite a while ago now, but... It was 10 years, yeah. 10, 11 years ago. I was really fortunate, one of the early short films I made called Milk with Bender Fricker done really really well in film festivals yeah and I thought I could go from that into making a feature and I tried to but this was in 2007 dear listeners <laughs> <laughs> do you remember <laughs> do you remember I think a small thing called a financial crash <laughs> then and it put pay to lots of yeah. uh, British films particularly a uh, low budget British films and it became really difficult to get a, a, another feature film on the go because it's an industry mm-hmm. it's about momentum yeah, you know you're hot so for you five felt minutes. And you've got this not. calling card which was milk and the reception that it had and sure. winning awards and stuff, and then suddenly it was like, well, we're not doing those films anymore. Well, the film I was doing, you, you know, trying to make it, it, it took about three three years. So I've been close to making a feature film two or three times, but each time it took three or you know three or four years of of my life, and that's mm-hmm. why it's taken me ten years from making. A, a short film to get in, to do a feature film which is like a well it's, that's a career yeah. in fact it's a life it's the age of my daughter yeah of course you know so I, I was very lucky at my tender age of managing to get a, a film away at my age you know and I suppose it's a cliche to say but did everything that you'd learnt then go into Daphne or did, were you wary of kind of throwing everything in there thinking <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think at the time you make a bit of work. I was so lucky that I met two producers, a production company, the Bureau, who are fantastic, small company. They, they care about the work and they, they make some brilliant films. So I saw a movie they made called Weekend. If 
few years ago. Mm-hmm. Have you ever seen that? Yeah, By a guy called Andrew Hay. Yes. He went on to make a film called 45 Years With Them, mm-hmm. which was nominated for an Oscar uh, last year, I think, or the year before. Right. So I saw this company's films. And they, Bertrand, who set up the Bureau, was one of the producers on Lynn Ramsey's Rat Catcher. Right. So I've been aware of them for a long time and I really like their films. So when I met them, we just clicked. So from meeting them with a short film, I took the short film and a first draft of the script to the Bureau and I said, this is the script and this is the girl we want to play. From doing that, from giving them that to shooting, being on the set, took a year. Yeah. Which was extraordinarily quick. You right. were so fortunate, you know. Other times it would, it would take me three years or, or something to get a script ready and by and that time... And no guarantee yeah, and, and still, as you say, momentum maybe yeah, moved on elsewhere. Sure, yeah. fashion, momentum, yeah. you know. Actors... They move on to other projects of if they're funded and things. So I was really, really fortunate, you know. And I suppose, I don't know, when you start working, you can only work a day at a time. Yeah. But what we did do is we, we planned as much as we could for the money that we had, you know, so we tried to maximise. So most first-time feature films, uh, they tell you not to have too many characters and not to have too many locations yeah. because you can spend your time travelling around the locations and spend more time travelling than shooting mm-hmm. because shooting's the expensive bit we thought well why don't we have lots of characters and locations because this character can't stay in a room she's not that type of person let's make a city film but why don't we set it in one area Yeah. so that we could get to the locations really quickly and ones that we knew and that we worked on in the short film so I think it's about planning I think the short films give you great training to try out ideas but mm-hmm. also on the practical side to plan to say right I know this won't work well I suppose I mean it's telling a story in, in as you say a set well one you're constricted by time but you're also constricted by budget and set yeah and you've, but you still want to get your story over yeah and we try and that's why we thought well we decided in advance a, 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 an aesthetic or a visual approach to the film with the lenses so basically we chose to work 90% of the film was shot on two lenses right um and we decided the lens package in advance so that we knew that if we made rules that we just had to stick to them. So we made the rules when we were clear-headed. Because mm-hmm. when you're on the set and if you're thinking, well, I could use that lens or that lens. Oh, or I, that can, lens. I can go a bit further, yeah. It, it's a bit like a lead guitarist with an array of exactly, effects. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So if you see, you've just got the wah-wah pedal and that's your whack. <laughs> then yeah. that's, that's all you've got, you know. So we chose the same with the lenses, but we really like... Um, one of the, the key visual films, I don't think you'd notice it if you look at our film though, but it's Manhattan by Woody Allen. Right. So Gordon Willis, the cinematographer, shot Manhattan with two lenses. So we used the same two lenses, a 40 millimetre lens, because it, it doesn't feel camera present, you don't feel the lens, you actually just feel as if you're on the streets in Manhattan, it feels mm-hmm. as if you're there. And we used a 75 millimetre lens for close-ups. Yeah. And that was the that was the rule basically. So Gordon Willis, aka the Prince of Darkness, my favourite <laughs> cinematographer, because he didn't like to light very much. Right. He shot The Godfather like that, uh-huh. and he shot Manhattan like that, and he also shot Clute. Oh yes, well it is a film I haven't seen in a long time. Yeah, I think with the same lenses, mm-hmm. same idea, two lenses. You know, all of them. Um, I was reading lately that uh, all of Chinatown was shot on a forty millimeter lens. Wow, the whole film. So you can move the camera and you can move the actors. Woody Allen uses the 40 mil a lot for that and we stole lots of his ideas about blocking, you know, taking characters off screen. Yes. Which got, uh, which uh, Woody Allen says that he got from Gordon Willis. He said, you know, I can't mm-hmm. see them, can't see the actors in the frame, yes, but you can hear them. Yeah. They're going to come back in a minute. Don't worry about it. Yeah. They'll be there. So uh, that was that was the, the main visual approach. I suppose we wanted to make a film that was cinematic so we didn't shoot cutaways or insert shots mm-hmm. we used the medium shot as the master shot like they do and that's so the characters can move in the frame yeah you know all those uh, shots in the interiors in Woody Allen films people wander in and wander out so you're all, you are kind of framing a set almost and people move in and yeah. move out as if they come off stage and come on and, stage yeah and, and come back in and the way we worked out is we let the room not the actor Right. So you light the room. So wherever the actors go, the room is going to be lit. So sometimes mm-hmm. it'll be darker, sometimes lighter. Um, and we used 
we decided to do that, to take this approach from the get-go, before we even got to the set, so we made a set of aesthetic criteria and stuck to it, because on the set, if a big, you know, a big box of lenses came, <laughs> you might be tempted to, you know, to waste a bit of time and try one. Yeah. And we thought, no, we made this decision when we were clear-headed, and if I wanted to try something else, Adam Scarth, the cinematographer, would say, no. No. Here are the rules. Remember, we made our aesthetic rules. Let's stick to them. And that idea of not following the characters around having it framed, does that extend to Daphne as well? Because I suppose um, the... It, it, it does a bit, but we used a, quite a bit of moving camera in Daphne too. Yeah. We used quite a bit of steady cam and some of it. But the, the, the main frame is the medium shot yeah. you know, from the waist up so you can see, because she's quite a physical actress. Right. So her body really tells the story. She is a bit like Jenna Rollins in a sense in that way that she's quite a physical going back to Cassavetes and back to my favourite Cassavetes yeah. of course. Um you know, in that time between the short films, particularly Milk and Daphne, you also shot documentary called Come Close. I did. I shot an urban essay. Uh-huh. Um and about started off as a film about buildings and then it became a film about the relationship between people and buildings in Glasgow and uh, I've always been quite interested in urbanism and just before I started uh, Daphne I, I was going to do a PhD at the art school that's not right. very subject yeah. and thankfully I was saved <laughs> you do right <laughs> <laughs> is there a doctor in? <laughs> but, but I, I've always been interested in cities yeah you know, and I had a little bit of money um, to develop a documentary idea whilst I was waiting for a, a, a fiction feature to be funded and I decided to make a, a documentary, which every one of the eight people who saw it said they really enjoyed. <laughs> Absolutely, well, I was one of them. <laughs> but I just wondered whether shooting that um, affected the way you shot other things. Um, I don't know. I think it's a, that film was really about intimacy. And I suppose, for me, if there's a subject or a theme I'm quite interested in, I'm interested in intergenerational mm -hmm. subjects, parents and children, often, and I'm interested in enforced intimacy, Yeah. in a sense, you know? Yeah. And rather than it being my sole love-making technique... <laughs> <laughs> It's something that I don't know. It's something I, 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 I'm probably acutely aware of in public because I don't really like people. I like the <laughs> idea of them. Yes. <laughs> but in a way, that goes to um, Daphne's you know, desire to kind of be on her own. To, to, to oh, it's control. Uh, yeah, she has absolutely. control issues, you know. Um, she's, she's her own entertainment. She doesn't need an audience, if you see what I mean. Yes. She's quite happy to party in the house on her own, or with others. So without giving anything away, obviously, you talked about forced intimacy. Does that idea kind of come into it? It does, basically. Daphne starts off in, in the movie being a bit of a dick. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. She's very opinionated. She... She's hard work sometimes, but I think she's funny. But I, I see that she's built up this wall that she feels she needs a shell mm -hmm. to survive. Yeah. You know, so she probably feels too much and she's made herself a bit too cool in order to cope with the travails of life, you know. So, so the, the film is basically, there's not a message in the film, right. thank goodness. Yes. But what I think you do see is someone... No starts, hugging, no learning. No hugging, no learning. <laughs> uh, you see someone who's starting to realise that the, that the way they're living probably isn't going to be very good for them in the long term. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they maybe start to think about... Well, she starts to think about what she might be able to do about that in future. But we tried to make it as three-dimensional as possible, so there's no great moment, you know, when the yeah. scales fall away from her eyes or anything. Yeah, but I think there's definitely a, a dramatic progression in the film and if you love those 70s new wave films which I do so much then I think you'll see something of, of that in them well I know you've got places to go and people to see so we'll wrap it up fairly soon but just to say it's, it's, at the moment is kind of Daphne all 
encompassing or have you got any idea what you're going to do next? Is that an incredibly unfair thing? Uh, I don't know if it's unfair. Uh, basically, we're doing... We've been in festivals this year. We opened in Rotterdam, went to South by Southwest, Melbourne. So the, the movie, we sold it in quite a lot of territory. We're very lucky for a first-time film. So I have a bit of festival work to do with the film for the next year. We're in a competition in a, a, some European countries, um, some pretty good festivals. And I'm getting, I'm in early stages now of thinking about the next thing. So I can't really say what it is, but um, there's a good chance we'll be shooting something in the spring. Yeah. It's the Danny McGrain story. The Danny McGrain story. <laughs> <laughs> well, <I Peter>. wish. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much for uh, talking to us. Great to see you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. And uh, we'll be back very soon with uh, someone completely different. Cheers. Mm-hmm.